Hello, welcome to hey. Economics Matters. Uh, my name is Alex Kotlikoff. Today, uh, we're joined by, of course, my co-pilot and father, uh, Larry Kotlikoff, and uh, Theo Kotkin. Uh, actually, um, an ex-boss of mine. I, I interned for him one icy winter many, many years ago. Um, Theo is a professor of risk management at VU University Amsterdam. He's an extraordinary professor at NWU University in South Africa, and he's the founder of the Anglo-Dutch pension investment and risk management firm Cardano, which he's going to tell us all uh, a lot more about. I'm going to I'm going to bring it I'm going to bring it over to Larry here so he can give more of a bio and then we're going to get going to get into a discussion about Cardano and sort of Theo's life and what he's been working on currently. Yeah, so uh Theo, it's great to have you. Uh, Theo is an old friend. Uh he's a uh, somebody of uh he's a brilliant economist and uh uh business person and social activist who's doing fantastic work through Cardano development, which is his current enterprise uh, in Africa and other parts of the uh, emerging frontier world. Uh, and uh, uh, I met Theo from his work on generational equity. Uh, he's very much involved in that with uh, the Dutch, you know, talking to the Dutch government and the Dutch people about uh, what's a, equitable way to resolve their long-term pension crisis. He's uh, done several, I'm going to let Theo fill in the, the, the storyline, uh, but he's done uh, videos and uh, movies uh, uh, with uh, Terry Jones, who was part of my Monty Python uh, on uh, some of these generational uh, problems, but also on the financial crisis. So uh, he has a Great movie called Boom Bust Bust Boom Bust Boom, boom. yes or Bust Boom Bust <laughs> anyway uh, anyway uh, he's going to tell us about his uh, movies but um, more importantly what he's currently doing I think uh, to begin with I I, I want to uh, point out that uh, he started this fantastically successful company back around nineteen let's see the year two thousand and. Uh, I want to what, want to have uh, Theo fill in any gaps uh, in anything we've said so far about your background, but tell us about how you start uh, started Cardano, the risk management company, which now uh, has gone from one employee, which was you, to four hundred employees today, and now you know, now you've moved on to Cardano development. But tell us about the um, in addition to filling any parts of the bio we haven't mentioned. Fill in uh, the story of how you started this company and who your first client was and how you saved uh, one of the biggest companies or most important companies uh, in the world. The well, I started Cardano indeed in 2000 after 10 years of uh, being a risk manager, was head of risk management at ING. Um, and that was extremely interesting because they were really involved in emerging markets. But I thought that the way that they were dealing with pension funds was really not the way that I would I would really solve the problems in the uh, in pension fund balance sheet management. So I thought I can do this better, and I started Cardano and, and thought, you know, I'm going to really focus on tail risk, the extreme risks that pension funds um, should avoid that would kill them, and. In those days, in 2000, nobody could imagine that pension funds would be killed by because the funding ratios in, in, in Europe were all like 160, 180, you know, they were, they were abundantly rich. And they thought, what are you doing here? You know, we, we can't, you, you can't help us because there is no risk. There, uh, things are going well. And, but I found one, and that was KLM pension funds and uh, the pilots, and they, they saw risks. They see risks everywhere. They, you, know, you don't step into a plane and say, yeah, you know, with a few percent probability, we will crash, who cares? Uh, so they, they, they didn't think about a few percent probability. They thought, we don't want this pension fund to crash. Um, so and just for everybody to be clear, KLM is the Dutch Airlines. This is like KLM is the Dutch, the, 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 blue, the blue airline uh, that, uh, that is merged with uh, Air France uh, today, these days. Uh, so it's now Air France KLM. And, but in those days, they were not. And so we, we helped them to 
to protect against a, the pension fund against a, uh, a big crisis in the financial markets. So, so let, me because the stage, let, me, let me just set the stage. So for everybody, you know, uh, we don't have that many pension funds in the U.S. anymore. We used to, in the 80s, companies would all have pensions where they would tell their workers, look, uh, uh, we're not going to contribute to retirement accounts like 401ks. We're going to just give you a pension. When you retire, you get this payment that will continue until you die. And some some companies even index those payments to inflation. But those were kind of fixed guarantees. Those were liabilities that were for sure on the companies. It could have been I, IBM, for example, had a pension fund before they converted it to a 401k. They were the first big U.S. company to stop providing defined benefit pensions. To So you have this fixed obligation, and then you're setting some, some money away to fund that, but you're putting that money at risk. And this is what the corporate managers were doing. They, rather than insulating that obligation by buying bonds, they said, well, this is an opportunity to make, make a bundle. Uh, we have these payments. Uh, we set aside some money, but let's put it in the stock market. And for sure, we'll do okay in the long run. And the money will be there to pay uh, the required benefits in the future. And Theo looks at this in 2000. You set up your company. You're probably one or five people, whatever. And somehow, how do you get to talk to KLM about, or the pilots of KLM, about this pension fund problem that you saw that nobody else saw? Yeah, well, the situation around is that the pension fund is a, a separate entity from the company. And the pension fund is, is a, a kind of foundation. It's a very complicated thing, but it's, an, it's a not-for-profit institute. And um, the, the corporates cannot take any money out. Like, they cannot make profits with pension funds. So there was a problem in the, in the U.S. that they, if they took more risk, they could put it on the balance sheet and say, hey, we made money. But that's not possible in the Netherlands. And, but they do have to pay in. If, so they only have downside risk. So KLM, if they would lose money uh, in the pension fund, they have to put more extra money into the pension fund. But they, the pension fund was so big, 10 times bigger than the, uh, than the size of KLM on, on the stock exchange, that if they would lose 10%, they would take the whole company down yeah, because it was 10 times bigger, 10% of, of the 10 times bigger pension fund. So the, uh, the pilot said, we don't trust the corporate. We don't trust that they can ever pay into this pension fund if we, if we get into an underfunded situation. We want you to protect us so that we will never get into that situation. Well, how did they come to you? How did, you, did these pilots I just, just, I just went to them, you know. I thought these guys are smart. I, I had a lot of friends in Holland who are really active in the pension funds. One of them is Guus Boonder. He was really, and he said, you should talk to these people because this is, this is good. Your, your risk management knowledge is good for them. And they, they liked it. So we worked together. It's not that... Uh, I don't want to give all the credits to our company. Uh, I think they, they were really smart people and they really thought about risks and they, they, they engineered the whole thing together with us. So I had the, the financial knowledge. They had uh, the knowledge as, as pilots, you know, risk management. And that was really nice. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I, I only, actually with whole Cardano, I, I, I like to have only like 30, 40 very smart clients instead of, Knocking on everyone's door and 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 getting to to getting no way, you know, selling what just, they want just, to hear. So just to be clear, somebody you know uh, introduced you to the head of uh, this pension fund, and you had a meeting, and that led to working with them. Yeah, well, it was not that simple. You have many meetings and you have many disappointments, but in the end, we got very good friends with all of them, and they saw that we had knowledge that we would add value. So I always like to have clients that, that just want to work together with you in a project, not that you, you don't sell anything to them because we, were just, we just wanted to make sure that it fits their needs. And, and, and then we went to the market because we, have, we had expertise. How to, we, we had many people uh, in those days. There was the first year I hired a lot of people who worked at the banks and they know exactly how the bank think and how they sell their products. And so we know how, we knew how to uh, how to price these very complicated products. What the banks would, uh, so that they couldn't uh, charge us the wrong price. Uh, so we okay. we were in between. So just to be clear, the pension fund was invested 
heavily in the stock market. And what you did is you arranged, you and your colleagues arranged to buy secu financial securities called options, which would give, you know, pay off in the, it's like insurance. If the, market yeah. dropped, if the market dropped and this pension fund lost a lot of money because it was invested heavily in the stock market, then a consortium of banks that you did this deal with would pay up the difference. Would make Absolutely, it, yeah. Would the pension fund from that loss. And you said that in, in 2001, you had this deal in place with the banks and uh, the market crashed because of the dot-com bubble, whatever. Yeah. And because of that, you actually, your company saved KLM from actually going bankrupt. Is that true? Well, I, I would say the, the pilot saved uh, KLM from going bankrupt because they were involved. I don't, I won't, I won't say that I did it. I mean, I just helped them. And, uh, but they were the ones who took the risk and say, Hey, we want this. We, we, hmm. um, we really, uh, think this is necessary. So they, if they were not smart, I would never have done this. So it's thanks to them and my limited knowledge about financial instructions that, uh, made it work. So that was, that's, that's the real story. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to be the guy who says, hey, we did this and we saved them. But the funny thing was, so they, they did this transaction and we were doing the execution, helping them on behalf it's of KLM. Not, it's not exactly who did it, but I mean, no. you were there, they were there. Uh, together, you saved KLM from going bankrupt. KLM is one of the great com companies in the world. If that had gone bankrupt, that would have been a disaster for Holland, for the world, really. Uh, and and finance, what we're trying to get across here is that financial risk management can keep these financial disasters that we are seeing. Oh, look, we're seeing it today with FTX cryptocurrency situation. We saw it with, <laughs> you know, we had 17 major institutions fail in the Great Recession in the U.S. We had 27 worldwide. Uh, and had they had proper risk management, uh, as well as, you know, lots of other things that would have, could have been done. Uh, we don't have to live in that risky of financial world with, we have all kinds of sophisticated uh, yeah. securities that, that can be helpful, but also ways of um, limiting the risk. But anyway, that's where you started out. And then uh, through, through the years, you developed this company into something very profitable, but then at some point, you go a different direction and, and you, we have a bunch of questions. Maybe Alex, you want to start feeding them to, to Theo, we'll take him through systematically this, where he's at now, which is with Cardano development, which I view as a mini world bank being run by Theo. <laughs> uh, and it's actually more effective in many ways than the world bank uh, in terms of what you're doing. But anyway, Alex, well, I think the I'm going to jump around with some of our questions here, but I think that's a good setup for um, one of these. Um, I, I guess the the question is, uh, it Cardano is probably profitable, but it's a not for profit foundation. So how is it how is it financed? Yeah, Cardano that's good. So Cardano development, eh? Cardano was a profit is a, is a profit making company. Mm -hmm. But in 2007, I started Cardano development, which is a foundation. <coughs> and that's not for pro. And I, I'll explain why I made a foundation. <coughs> so, so I'll, st I'll tell the story just how I, how I started, because this is how entrepreneurship sure. works. So I, I was in a bar, which is a not so weird place for me to uh, to be and <laughs> in those days and still yeah. and then there were two guys from uh, from one of these development finance institutions one of the bigger ones in the world fmo it's a big development bank in the netherlands and they said you know what i think people should not take hard currency loans in developing countries they should take local currency loans but the development banks don't give them local currency loans because that's too risky for them. So we have to set up an institute where you can insure your um, your local currency risk as a bank, as a development well, let me, bank. Let me like just inter intervene just to make sure that the viewers and listeners understand what, exactly what we're talking about. If you're a company, let's say in Uganda, and you're selling 
whatever it is, mangoes, papayas, bananas, uh, and uh, you're, you're, maybe you're in agriculture because a lot of you got, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, the commerce there is, is agriculture and you need to borrow money from, let's say the World Bank or uh, some other major inst international institution bank, you have to borrow, let's say in dollars or euros. So, yep. if, but you're earning money in Uganda currency and there are many countries in Africa and they each have their own currency. So here you are, if, the, if your currency depreciates, if the Uganda currency depreciates, you're getting revenues in your local currency. I don't know what the currency is in Uganda. Shilling, Uganda shilling. Shilling. And meanwhile, you have to repay these loans in dollars or in euros or in pounds, and you're gonna go bankrupt. Yeah, and that's, that's it. What, that's what the story was when you started you know, getting involved in that particular uh, risk issue. For yes, so it's you know that risk is so big that many African com companies can't really handle it. They may not be able to get the loan to begin with because the lender views it as too risky. Uh, or if they do get the loan, they can go under very quickly. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we don't have you know, why Africa is largely underdeveloped. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And it continues to be. So this is a very major thing. So how do you uh, kind of resolve this problem? Yeah, so, and that's a good example with the farmers. And also, for example, uh, in some African countries, they, the, um, the power, the utility companies, the power plants, they borrow money in, in dollars, mm. and then suddenly their currency collapses, and they have to, repay in dollars but they can't so what do they do they increase the fees to all the people in in uganda or in kenya or and everybody has to pay more on their utility bill not because the energy prices went up uh, but just because the currency went down in their own country it's ridiculous so we said well we have to find something that the development banks um, like the African Development Bank, like the EBRD, the European uh, Bank for Reconstruction, like the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, that they will give loans in local currencies, but they can hedge themselves, they can insure themselves in a kind of a reinsurance company. And that, that's what these guys told me from FMO. And I said, yeah, but that's ridiculous because to set up that uh, insurance company, we need all the development banks to work together and to put money into one big fund as kind of, uh, equity yeah, that that would be the, the the cushion for in case of a crisis and they will never work together and that was 2005 and in 2007 there was a big seminar where we announced the launch of tcx the currency exchange uh, together with people from the world bank and they said this is fantastic we should have done this ourselves but it it's done by some some bunch of people in the netherlands and with the help of all the development banks so they all um joined and that was really one of the most surprising moments in my life and then suddenly we had this institute and then people at fmo said but where do we put the institute and after a, a few years of, of success they said well we don't want it in our uh, we, we're not entrepreneurs do you want to put it into cardano and i said well actually not because cardano can run it but then we get all these subsidies and, and grants from, from European and, and American uh, partnerships. So we'd rather put it in a, in a foundation, a not-for-profit foundation, so that the money that, that, do, that they could never tell, hey, this guy, Theo Cook, is making money out of um, development work and out of grants we give. So I want to separate it from my profit company. Profits you make by working hard, that was for the pension funds. And here we made no, we still worked hard. But we made not profits, but we got a lot of uh, European and American grants uh, in, into our company and even Australian. So ev everyone's involved in the world. And that's why I made a, a foundation, a not for profit foundation. Um, so, okay. And that's what became Cardano Development Foundation. So, how did you, you know, I'm always interested in how these things actually happen because you, you're making things happen in ways that other people look, the World Bank, all these IDB, all these. Uh, Asian Development Bank, all these international organizations spending decades not getting this to happen when it's critically important to happen. And you all of a sudden get this to happen. How, you know, obviously you had a 
a thriving company, you had this experience. So uh, did you get in to see the head of the World Bank, the head of the IDB, the head of your Yeah, bank? yeah. Not me, but so the people from, from FMO, like for example, the CEO of FMO, of the development bank in, in the Netherlands, was a friend of mine. And we visited with some other uh, friends, we visited all these banks in the world. And we said, you have to, you have to join us. And they did. That was my surprise that they did. And uh, wow. I just made sure that, to, that, that we had the right risk management tools, that we had the right systems to build it. And, and I, I helped them. And, but the main point was that they started to work together and they, uh, they never did this before. So, and since then, they, they work with Cardano development on many different projects because they, they can't do it on their own. They need to collaborate with uh, all the other development banks and actually, Cardano Development happens to be not one of the few institutes in the world where all the development banks come together and, and work together and try to do new projects. And we can do innovations. I mean, they're, they're not set up to be innovative. Eh? They, they're set up to they get money and they have to put loans into the market. That's what they do. And we, we, we try to, um, to improve where, where, where markets are failing, like with the currency, currency risk. It's a failure in the market. So we try to solve that failure. And that's how we step-by-step step set up new companies where every time there is a, is a market failure, is an, uh, a gap, we try to fill it in. And then we say to these development banks, IFC in, in Washington and, and everyone in the world, why don't you join us, help us? And then they, they, they become the partner and they partner in many different companies now within Cardano development. So the way, the way the transaction would work is, let's say I'm the World Bank and I make a loan to some a uh, company might be small farmers in Uganda uh, in, in uh, their local currency in the Uganda shilling. And then I go and I go buy some insurance from uh, Cardano Development or from TCS. Yeah. Oh. It's, I, I buy so you buy a kind of, you buy, actually you buy a currency swap um, okay. and, and you, you hedge your risk. So if the currency that you, so you give, for example, going back to Uganda shilling, because my, my wife is from Uganda, mm -hmm. um, but uh, going to Uganda Shilling, you give a loan in Uganda Shilling, but as a development bank, uh, so the African Development Bank, for example, you don't want to be exposed to that Uganda Shilling. So what you're saying is, um, okay, I, I go to TCX within Kadan Development and they say, well, I give this 50 million uh, US dollar, but then in, in shilling terms, can you hedge it for me? If the shilling uh, depreciates in value, I get more money from you in, in the contract. If it goes up in value, which doesn't happen that often, but if it would go up against the dollar um, and, and we profit from it as a bank, I give you some money. So you, you, get an, you stabilize your entire income. I see, okay. Yeah. The, um, and uh, this costs, the, on average, this costs these institutions something, but they're, they're getting money in from the developed world to sustain themselves. So this is a good way for them to actually provide uh, provide development aid in effect, yeah. right? There's some cost to this. Uh, this well, thing. actually, over the first few 15 years now, we made a few percent return even. Because right. what you do is you, 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 you have to carry, so you get more interest rates the higher interest rates on these products, but you have the risk of devaluation. But in total, uh, on accidentally, it delivered them a small return. Could have been a could have been a negative return. Um, and and the idea is that it shouldn't cost them because some currencies will go up, some currencies will go down, and on average, it will not deliver that much return. And what they do, they pay my team. That we have twenty five people working for TCX. And every year they say, this is what we need for the salaries, for the building, for the IT, and they pay us. So it's a not-for-profit uh, ID. It's not very expensive for them, um, 25 people. And then you do, we do a few billion of transactions every year. And uh, in that respect, it's a cheap product. Hmm. So um, when you say a few billion, I guess you could probably, Africa could probably use like a trillion. Uh, Absolutely. Well, yeah, I, I wanted to ask about that because uh, I think you've called Africa the well, you've called the 21st century the century of Africa, which is which is pretty interesting because if you look at you know like population growth rates, um, 
and uh, economic prospects for some countries, I think that's that's certainly a possibility. Um, but I think uh, I think maybe we've already answered this question, but um, is Africa getting enough sort of private capital or equity um, into the country to actually spur development? If not, like, where is it going? Um, yeah. And also, I wanted to add on, uh, what about uh, what about China's investment in Africa? Do you do you uh, do you perceive that as a way of um, sort of uh, uh, developing the country um, more than maybe the Western world, um, just in terms of their investment? Yeah. Okay. Clear. Well, first of all, there is a, a huge gap of money that they need. For example, infrastructure, uh, Africa will need 100 billion per annum. Asia, uh, Southeast Asia and India will need 200 billion per annum. They, they get a few billion, but only a small percent. So that's a big, that's a big problem. Eh? We, they, they need much more than they get. And infrastructure also means uh, power stations, solar panels, you know, everything that's related to, to um, building the country. Uh, and so that, that's a big issue. And... That's only that's not only solved by the development finance institutions because they they do put money in and what we did with TCX is to make sure that it's not not only enough money but it's it's the right money like local currency local currency is important. So the second thing we try to do is pension funds. They have so much money. They have so in Holland we have sixteen hundred billion euros. It's simple because a euro is a dollar now, eh? so that's uh, yeah. easy. Uh, thanks for that <laughs> parity. That's easy to calculate. But those are really enormous amounts. They hardly put any money into countries they don't know. So they call them emerging markets. But what they call emerging markets to me are already developed markets. I mean, it's like, like uh, well, I can't call them developed, but at the BRIC countries like Brazil and Russia and mm-hmm. India, um, okay, they, they have access to, to some the, uh, pension money. But how much money goes to Ghana or Uganda or, uh, you know, Rwanda, Kenya? And then, so what we did, and this is one of the things I really like what we did this year, it's called ILX. And so institutional money should go from pension funds in Holland, but also in Europe, everywhere in America, to Africa, to build Africa and to make, to make Africa great again. And so what we did was, we said, you know, these development banks, they know a lot about these countries and pension funds don't. Every time a development bank uh, puts a billion or a few hundred million into a, a, a country, a company, and give them a loan, they will ask a pension fund, hey, why don't you do a co-loan with us, a B loan, a syndicated loan? We, we put 50 million in, you put 50 million in. And we managed to set up a fund, which is called ILX Fund, where um, the ABP pension fund in the Netherlands and the construction workers and the transportation pension fund put in more than 1 billion this year as a start. It's only a start. Um, And they co-invest in all the loans that these development finance institutions uh, provide to Africa and uh, Southeast Asia and, and Middle Europe. So across the world, every low and medium income country where Knowledge is very limited by uh, because of lack of data, lack of uh, their fear for corruption. Of course, these DF, these development banks know a lot about these countries, and so we we managed to make them co-invest, and that's one of the again, it's only one billion, and and it should be hundred billion, and that's where we go for. We will go for hundred billion, and uh, one billion now, ten billion in a few years' time, and then hopefully. Uh, I hope people will copy us. So I hope other people say, hey, we, we're going to set up the same kind of fund. We're going to do this because we don't care. We, we hope we get copied and that other people do the same. And then that's, what, that's one of the ways that we try to get more um, money into, uh, into Africa, and into low, low-income countries. So, so let me ask you if the, you know, if the, let's say the, um, some pe- pension fund in Holland is investing uh, I take it they're investing in lots of different co-investing in lots of projects. So they're re- there's uh, hedging the risk across the projects. But you know, are these investments on average likely to make money? Uh, I, I realize there's risk. You know, 
how do you get a pension fund to invest in Africa when the basic story about investing in Africa is everywhere you put your money, you're going to lose it? Yeah, and that, and that story is wrong. And the good thing is, there are, there are two sides. The good thing is that the development finance institutions have an extremely good track record. So all every time they invest into a company, they know exactly what they're doing. It can be banks, can be um, uh, utility power companies, can be uh, yeah, road building things, you know, uh, these big projects. They have a very low default rate. They have very good uh, performance numbers. And uh, they have like 4% plus over uh, LIBOR rates uh, return and with low default rates. So we can show that, that this went well. The point is the development banks can show this. They showed it for, for this uh, ILX thing, but it's not public. It's not that everyone can see it. So one of the things, and I think you touched a very good point there, Larry, is we need some kind of uh, democratization of, of the data. We need all these data that these development finance institutions have should be available, anonymous, of course. You don't give the data exactly about all the companies, but you should, the, the risk return data should be available because people are that scared about uh, Africa. But there are so many good projects in Africa, and uh, it's just that they lag behind a little bit in, in the infrastructure and other things. But it's not that, that everything is corrupt in Africa or everything. They're going to grow from 1.2 billion people to 4 billion people. We need to make sure that the right money gets into that country. Uh, all, otherwise, we get trouble. Let me just stop and emphasize what you just said. 1.4 to two billion to 4 billion. They're going to grow by about two and a half Chinas over the next 80 years. In Absolutely. Terms of UN demographic projections. Unless we can raise labor productivity in Africa, we're going to have, you know, massive amounts of numbers of Africans who are going to be on the shore of North Africa trying to get into Europe, uh, just like we yeah. have massive numbers of people at the Mexican-U.S. border trying to get into the, into the U.S. So it's imperative for the developed world to help the developing world to grow because those people really don't want to leave their homes, but they want a, a decent thing. You know, climate change is imperiling them, and uh, so this is so. What you're doing and what they're doing is uh, these institutions is it has to be scaled up dramatically. But let's go to Alex's yeah. question for you. Which well, is, I mean, I, I guess the no, no, my I want to get to your question about China, Alex. Yeah, China is a good one, but yeah, China yeah. Did, did invest a lot in Africa. But I recently saw in the Economist that they they stopped doing loans in Africa. They reduced that yeah. a lot. So I think they 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 put it on hold. I don't know what they're doing. But first, people in the West start to get afraid, like oh, China's taking over Africa. But I've seen the roads that the Chinese build in, in in Africa, and they're doing a good job. I mean, we we can blame them for everything. Mm -hmm. But if we don't do anything. Well, why can't why start to blame the Chinese that they, yeah, but they want something in return. Yeah, well, fine, yeah, but uh, right. we need to do something. So then we have to step up in the West and say, then we're going to invest 10 times more than we do now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's why the my question is, um, this is not one of the, the questions I had written down, but maybe the 21st century is uh, perhaps China and Africa, if the if the U.S. in particular doesn't really invest in Africa and take a hold of the, pro the gaining productivity of the population, but also just the, the skyrocketing population growth rates, it's just out of control. Um, so do, do you think that's a possibility that that basically the that uh, world development and power is going to move towards sort of China and Africa in the 21st century? Well, it certainly will move towards China. Um, so you guys get better used to it. <laughs> we guys get used to it, and that that will happen. Uh, but that's my my bigger worry is that those four billion people. I would, right. Think about the people in Mexico. We're talking about a few million people in south uh, southern part of America and Middle America that want to escape towards North America. There are already people running from Sudan. Uh, thousands of people. Across the Sahara, they, they die or they make it to the to the Mediterranean and then they die on, on, on a boat. 
and and this is it's just happening i mean nothing is really growing yet but it, the, the real explosion will happen the next 50 years and then it will flatten down and we're not prepared and this is with everything is with climate change it's also with demographic changes we don't do anything i mean this should be on number one on the agenda and of course they're talking about it on, on the uh, on the cop 27 uh in in egypt this year but uh there's not much money going into africa and uh, so I, I to me that's the reason that i i put a lot of time into canal development because i think yeah. this is uh, i mean I have, we have to do this. I mean, there's no other option. I can spend yeah. my time on details on pension funds in the Netherlands, but this is so much more important that we have to do this. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, maybe you want to talk a little bit, I'm sure you know about the uh, effects of climate change already in Africa. I mean, there's tremendous drought, uh, particularly in the Horn of Africa. There's yeah. lots of instability. Um, do you, what do you, what do you perceive in terms of the future uh, with regards to climate change and uh, its effects? Yeah, so there will be there is a lot of drought indeed i was there in the in the eastern part of africa this year was terrible it was just terrible you see just the, the, these animals all the cows they have they were dying and, and the people were desperate so and that's going to be worse uh, you, you get the el nino that changes all the time and, and, and all these effects will get get worse and worse you get drought you have you have uh, floods in, in, in Mozambique. So it's, it's just like in Europe, by the way, and in America and in Australia, everything is going to get. But they, they are going to get hit much more because we have a more or less stable or shrinking population. We're prepared for it. Our infrastructure is, is, is adjusted. But they, they have this explosion and, uh, of people. And the, the poorer they stay, the more people they still want to have. That's the, the point, because the, the children will die. So they, 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 they just naturally feel we need a lot of children. So it's even making the whole thing worse. So I think that, that we, uh, we need to, do, to invest a lot in, in, in the climate effects, in, in, in uh, agriculture. And we're doing that also with Kadana. We, we help with the Agri3 fund, which is agriculture, in, uh, that, that's more sustainable agriculture. Uh, prevent uh, deforestation, uh, make sure that people, and that's also 1 billion we try to mobilize into that direction, but it also needs to be 200 billion instead of 1 billion. And, so, um, and there are not many projects next to ours, otherwise I wouldn't be worried, but uh, it's a limited amount of, of projects in, in the world. There are a lot of people working on it, but um, so agriculture and, and, and uh, forest uh, prevention and those kind of things that so so important for uh, for Africa and also for for parts of of course of uh, Asia and uh, other parts of the world, low income countries that that are suffering from climate change. That yeah, but we we try to get money from this COP twenty seven for climate actions and uh, they they're struggling to get a few billion, yeah, but they need ten to fifty times more. This might be uh, you know we have this. Uh competition between this uh, declining hegemon, which is the US and the rising hegemon, which is China. There's an article called The Future of Global Economic Power, which is on my website at kotlikoff.net. I just posted with some colleagues, which uh, gives a pretty good picture of um, the future, which is under conservative assumptions, China will be about two and a half times the US uh, GDP by the end of the century. But this, you know, so this competition between the, these two powers and the military focus, uh, this would be an opportunity for the for us in China to join hands and say we need to jointly invest. We need to uh, join China in investing jointly in Africa and uh, India and in uh, South America and these developing worlds. Uh, so maybe, Absolutely. maybe that's what President Biden should be focusing on uh, to try and change the, to start doing things with, with China where we're not competing, where we're doing things jointly. Um, yeah. To set they do, you know, this book is called The Ministry of the Future. Yeah, and yeah, I know that book. My, my, my friend just sent it to me, actually, my best friend. He loves that book. <laughs> it, it, it starts with... 
a, a heat wave in India and it's so terrible and, and, and all the people die in the city except for one guy and he escapes and he has nightmares and, and then people start to have to do climate attacks, terrorist people because they want, uh, so they, they're going to bomb the airplanes and the uh, everything that's, that's destroying the planet. And, and, Ch- and India is going to do the right things. And this is just scenario thinking. That's of right. course. And it was a very, it's a very nice scenario how at, at the end people started to work together and, and the world was trying to, um, yeah, to embrace um, cooperation much better than they do now. And we first need a terrible, terrible event before we, and, and that's, I, I'm afraid that that's what always will happen. We need terrible events. How, how far away is the drought in, um, in Africa for the, for the average American or European? Hardly anyone knows about it. It, it, it. Some people do, but most people don't. So they don't care. You need something terrible to happen before, uh, before we will really do something. So but okay, we, we, I, I'm only trying with Kadana Development to make steps and 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 to uh, so we know that we can improve things. We only need to scale it up by a factor of fifty. Okay. So listen, Theo, you you've, you had this successful career as an academic. Then you had this successful career building this huge risk management company. Then you branched off and are doing this nonprofit, which is making huge a huge difference. Although you needs to be scaled up. Uh, but then you also have this career as a filmmaker. Could you, as we wind down here, talk about the, the films you've uh, made and have just made and uh, that uh, and what, yeah. what I focus on and what we're, because you are such an interesting person and we want to lay the groundwork here for you to get the Nobel Peace Prize. So uh, who knows, could happen. Because you are doing, you know, you're making a difference in real in a real way that um, uh, we're happy at Economics Matters, the podcast, to basically be be presenting you to uh, uh, to the wider world here what you're what you're doing uh, on the without anybody knowing about it, really in general. But anyway, tell us about the movies, the whole uh, what your focus is on that. The movies are, um, yeah, more or less. Um, accidental in the sense that I, of course, we like you, uh, I was also writing, but then I ran into uh, Terry Jones from Monty Python and he was interested in what I was telling him about uh, finance, for example, and, and how these booms and busts are uh, in, like in 2007, 2008, that crisis was a crisis of human behavior, not a crisis of of uh, some alien things coming inside. It's something endogenous eh, from inside our uh, society and it repeats itself. And he was truly interested. How did you meet Terry Jones? How does it, how is it that you in the world of finance go to meet uh, this guy from one of the leaders, of stars of Monty Python, one of the writers of the, of the movies uh, and the, one of the actors. How do you end up meeting Terry Jones? That was simple. Uh, I was in Toronto uh, with Keith Ambox here, the pension uh, specialist. And he had a friend, Rob Buckman. And I talked to his friend and said, you know, I want to do something uh, with ex- explaining risk management. But then is with something funny with, with, with like Monty Python. And he said, oh, I know Monty Python guys. I work with them. And then he introduced me to Terry. And uh, that's how we got friends. We made some small projects. And then we made this big film, Boom, Buzz, Boom. And um, okay, with his you, son, you introduced us to Terry, me and Alex to Terry as well, right? Sorry, yeah. You, you then introduced both Alex and I to Terry. We were very, you know, he's passed away, but he was yeah. a lovely guy and, and uh, yeah. we're very special person, very special. Him. Yeah, him. But, and so then, and then I made a film late uh, last year, finished last year. Uh, about how we do a lot of things with uh, things wrong with our uh, old age. Pre- preparing for old age needs to implies financial planning, and that's your uh, expertise, Larry. And then it also um, implies that we have to plan as a human being better that we want to stay active when we get older. And most people are not prepared for uh, for retirement. They just dropped out of the whole working process and then they they get socially isolated and 
Um, I wanted to show how countries like Japan, where people work much longer because they, first of all, they had to, but they also enjoy it a lot when they have to work longer. And, and in Ghana, where they don't have a pension, so they have to work longer, but how they cope with it and how sometimes how beautiful it can be that you work longer and you stay happy and, and active and healthy. So this new movie. And that's what I want to show. What's the name of this new movie? I forget. Your 100 Year Life. What? Your your hundred year life. So there's a somebody at the beginning of this movie that I recognize pretty well. Who could that yes, be? That's, uh, like Mr. Kolnikov. Uh, <laughs> it's in the uh, it's in the trailer. You can put the trailer on your on your website, and then uh, yeah, so, so Larry's all over the place. I just got to say, I was in Europe um, doing some work, and my wife came over, and we met Theo. He came down to to Strasbourg when we were spending a week vacation uh, with his wife Victoria. And before we met them, he sent us sent me a link to this movie that, that's coming out of your hundred year life. I guess it's about to be um, released, and all of a sudden, there I am, which is <laughs> fire taping of boom bus boom. You grab some uh, some of the shots or whatever, uh, but it's a great apart from my appearance. It's a great great film because it does show that this these issues of aging and sustaining yourself through the uh through what can be a, a longer period of time than you actually worked and in the case of americans since we're retiring so early uh this is a universal problem and we Absolutely. have an interesting thing about the demographics um because i've been studying that as part of writing this paper about the uh, future global economic power which incorporates all these u.n demographics is they're kind of baked in stone in the sense that you know, the, the fertility rates are coming down in Africa, even though Africa's a total population is yeah. rising dramatically. There's so many young people. You don't have to have more births. You just have to have the current young people become adults and they have kids at declining rates. And that's enough to get the entire African population to skyrocket. Yeah. And that's really what's going on Not in the Middle East too. There's an enormous increase in other places like china population is going to drop by 400 million that's bigger than the u.s population yeah. in 80 years and uh japan's going to drop you know like i think they're going to lose 40 million out of 140 million or so, so russia's population is going to fall so you have these incredible changes um and uh, uh, the aging in every every part of the world is going to get older uh China is going to get go from like six percent over sixty five to thirty percent over the course of the century. Yeah. That is going to have produce enormous fiscal stresses because paying for all these old people who may need health care, will need health care and pensions. That's a big deal. So uh, this is a very it's very very important for people throughout the world to keep working because people are not saving enough on their own certainly not in the US. And in China, they don't have great instruments to save in. You can save in the in housing and we're seeing what's going on in housing in, yeah. in China, all kinds of fraud and overbuilding. And we're, you can save in the stock market, but that's not well regulated. You can save abroad because you're restricted. So every yeah. country- So it's all over the world. Yeah, it's all over the world. It's the same. So yeah, we, we have, and, and we, we never prepare for these disasters. So you can see them coming. It's like, I, I call it that you, you get hit by a, by a glacier, you know? But what happened to you? I got hit by a glacier. The glacier goes one millimeter per, per year, and, but you still get hit by it because it's, right. it's so slow, but we, we die from, from these very slow processes. We don't anticipate them. Even though they're in front of our face. So Exactly. Right. Well, they're too Alex, slow. Yeah. Alex, I'll let you have the last word uh, to wrap things up. Well, I just I think that's a great metaphor uh, in terms of the future. Um, there's sort of glacial events, but I would I would add maybe that they're already hitting us, as Theo was saying, in terms of um, climate impacts in Africa and actually all over the world right now. Um, but it seems like that the world right now is sort of in a stagnant phase where we're not actually planning for the future there's a kind of presentism right now. And it seems that um, we need to actually focus on what we know is coming down the road. Uh, so I just want to yeah. thank Theo for 
sort of articulating that and uh, tell our viewers that we all need to kind of focus on that, think about that for the future. Absolutely. Great. Thank you for having me in your uh, video series, Famous People. <laughs> yeah, great to see you again, and uh, we'll be in touch. You enjoy your okay. time in the, the Canary Islands where you're, where you're uh, coming from <laughs> at the moment. Okay. <laughs> Take care. I'm just going to turn. Have a nice weekend. Bye bye. Thanks, Theo. Bye bye.